Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to provide a literary analysis of John Dryden's witty and feisty but also perhaps slightly jaded poem, Farewell Ungrateful Traitor, also known as Song. The poem formed part of John Dryden's popular play, which was very popular in its own time, The Spanish Friar, published in 1681. So in terms of the outline of today's lecture, I'm going to start by reading through the poem. I'm then going to provide some literary context for the poem so that we can understand it a bit more fully. And then I'm going to provide a line by line literary analysis of the poem, focusing particularly on the rhyme scheme and the rhythm and the various antithetical constructions uh, within the poem that help to create the oppositional tone that's central to the meaning of the poem. So here is the poem itself. Farewell, ungrateful traitor. Farewell, my perjured swain. Let never injured creature believe a man again. The pleasure of possessing surpasses all expressing, but tis too short a blessing and love too long a pain. Tis easy to deceive us, in pity of your pain. But when we love, you leave us, to rail at you in vain. Before we have decried it, there is no bliss beside it, but she that once has tried it will never love again. The passion you pretended was only to obtain, but when the charm is ended, the charmer you disdain. Your love by ours we measure, till we have lost our treasure, but dying is a pleasure when living is a pain. To start with some of the literary context of the poem. So John Dryden's poem, known as Farewell Ungrateful Traitor, but which was also called Song, within the text of the play it's called Song, and it appears in Act 5, Scene 1 of Dryden's frequently performed tragicomedy, The Spanish Friar, or The Double Discovery. Although we do not know exactly when John Dryden wrote the text, it was new to the stage in October 1680 and was published in print form in March 1681. So this is peak restoration literary period where bawdiness and wit really dominated the literary landscape. So let's keep that in mind as we read through the poem, the ideas, the ideas of bawdiness and wit. So bawdiness being fruity, um, shall we say, sort of making uh, puns and jokes about sex and wit, a mode of expression which um, shows off one's intelligence uh, and one's kind of humour uh, simultaneously. So the context for the song within the play is that Queen Leonora thinks that she has been abandoned by the man she loves, her husband Torresmond. Now, Torresmond really does love her, but he's conflicted because she had acceded to the murder of his father, which she now repents. But she had acceded to the murder by Bertrand, who she was betrothed to. So Queen Leonora had hoped that this plot, this plot of murder, would put an end to any marriage between her and Bertrand. So, and at, although as it turns out, one of the double discoveries is that the father has not been killed, Torresmond at this point believes that he has, and he believes that his wife had kind of accepted that the murder was going to go ahead. So, Torresmond, you might say, is justified in going off her slightly. But she doesn't know that he knows. And Queen Leonora talks to her companion, Teresa, and draws on the characters of Olympia and Barino from Ludovico Ariosto's 16th century epic poem, Orlando Furioso, which was first published in 1516. In Ariosto's 
poem. Olympia, who is in love with Barino, refuses to marry another man, Arbante, and Olympia has Arbante killed uh, in order to avoid <laughs> the wedding. So there is a parallel. You can see why Queen Leonora might draw on Olympia, because there's a parallel involving um, murder and men those two female characters are betrothed to but not in love with and um, that this kind of murderous plot comes about because they want to avoid um, the wedding. So Olympia and Barino do get married but he then deserts her on a desert island because he has fallen in love with another woman and Queen Leonora worries and wonders if she has been betrayed for the same reason. Here is the beginning of Olympia's lament from Canto 10, stanza 27 of Ariosto's poem, Orlando Furioso, uh, to provide some context for understanding John Dryden's poem. So this is the kind of illusion that Queen Leonora is making. And in Ariosto's poem, the text reads, and this is a tr translation, a 19th century translation, stretched on the bed, Upon her face she lay, Olympia, bathing it with her tears. Last night in thee, together, two found shelter, did she say. Alas, why two together are not we at rising? False Verino, cursed day that I was born. What here remains to me to do? What can be done? Alone, betrayed, who will console me? Who afford me aid. John Dryden's song Farewell Ungrateful Traitor is introduced in the play The Spanish Friar with Queen Leonora explicitly alluding to Olympia's complaint. So the text reads, my heavy heart the prophetess of woes forebodes some ill at hand to soothe my sadness sing me the song which poor Olympia made when false Barino left her. Dryden's song is his own invention, but it draws on Ariosto's characters. And immediately in the first line, we can see that there is a kind of irony here. So the first line, farewell ungrateful traitor. Now that this song, the poem, is as though from the mouth of Olympia, but it's ironic that Queen Leonora is uh, drawing on this uh, poem in the play because uh, her lover, Torresmond, has not been an ungrateful traitor. He isn't in love with another woman. He has a legitimate reason for uh, seeming to have gone off Queen Leonora. So the whole poem then about man's inconstancy and um, that women can't trust men because they go off them as soon as um, they've slept with them is it doesn't apply to the situation that Queen Leonora is actually in. So Queen Leonora is making this complaint that you know this terrible fate happens to all women and all men can't be trusted and this fate has happened before to Olympia and other women, you know, Dido and I mean there's a whole sort of trove of historical women who have been abandoned by men which um, Queen Leonora is drawing on but the irony is that it doesn't apply actually in this situation and the audience at the time who were watching the whole play as the poem is being performed would know that this doesn't apply. That's part of the joke. Now onto the literary analysis, the dissection of the poem. So Dryden's poem is composed of three octaves or octets. Each of these three stanzas is structured using exactly the same form. It is composed of two quatrains, so four lines, with a full stop at the end of the fourth line. And the rhyme scheme uh, remains exactly the same. The B rhyme, act, the B rhyme itself is repeated also in each stanza. So the rhyme scheme is A B A B C C C B, and it repeats, but with different rhymes apart from the B rhyme. D B D B 
E E E B and then F B F B G G G B. So we start with the each um, stanza starts with a fairly conventional A B A B rhyme, but then there are three C rhymes in a row, and this sort of creates a sense of culmination and build up, almost as if the B line is a kind of um, punchline, sort of um, the, the building up, the accumulation is sort of undercut by the returning B rhyme. And if we just take all of the B rhymes within the poem, we can see that the message is very clear, what's being kind of repeated strongly. Swain again, pain, pain in vain, again, obtain, disdain, pain. And furthermore, at the end, uh, the end rhyme of each stanza, we have pain again, pain. It seems to doom women to repeat this same cycle indefinitely. Pain again, pain, pain again, pain, pain again, pain. Looking also at the rhythm. So all the lines in the poem are in duple metre, which means that they are composed of two syllable metrical feet. And they are iambic, quite strongly iambic in rhythm, meaning that the second syllable in each metrical foot is emphasised. So for example, line eight, and love to long a pain. So it's the second syllable in each metrical foot that is highlighted. And each stanza follows the same rhythmical structure which, which enhances the B rhyme. So we have the B rhyme enhancing itself because the B rhyme is repeated in all three of the stanzas, but furthermore, that's supported also enhanced by the rhythm, which I will explain uh, how now. So the B uh, rhyme lines are iambic trimeter. Trimeter being um, three metrical foot per line. So, so six beats overall. And the B rhyme is emphasised by the rhythm as well as the rhyme at the end of each line. So because it's iambic and because there are six beats, a, a, an emphasised beat falls at the end of the line. As I said earlier, line eight, and love to long a pain. Pain is emphasised by the rhythm as well as by the rhyme. And this rhyme and rhythm is very strong throughout the whole poem. So farewell, my perjured swain, believe a man again and love too long a pain. In pity of your pain, to rail at you in vain, will never love again, was only to obtain the charm you disdain when living is a pain. So all the B rhymes have this masculine ending, as it's called. So a masculine ending is um, an ending of a, a metrical verse line uh, with a stressed syllable. And this obviously creates a strong emphasis on the rhyme. So the emphasis on the final B rhymes and rhythms is exacerbated because the other lines in the poem are not emphasised at the end. They are not masculine they do not have masculine endings. In fact, the other lines in the poem are composed in catalectic iambic tetrameter. So what does that mean, catalectic iambic tetrameter? Tetrameter means that there are four metrical feet in the line. So, and uh, what does catalectic mean? So catalexis derives from the classical Greek for leave off. So catalexis is the omission of a syllable in the last foot of a line of verse. The omission of a syllable in the last foot of a line of verse. So the iambic catalexis in the non-B rhyme lines means that they all have feminine endings, as they're called. A feminine ending is an ending of a metrical verse line uh, where it ends on an unstressed syllable. And just as a sort of aside, catalexis most often happens actually on trochaic feet. So a trochaic 
uh, metrical foot is where you have uh, the emphasis at the beginning and the unstressed syllable second. So bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. That's catalectic. And it normally ends, as catalectic normally happens on a trachaic line so that you do have a masculine ending in that case. Bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. That's catalectic and that is more usual. So this poem actually is quite unusual in having a catalectic ending on an I am, which means that the stressed part of the final metrical foot is not, uh, is removed. So what's left is an unstressed sort of hanging extra syllable. So if we read through, for example, the pleasure of possessing surpasses all expressing, but tis too short a blessing. So you can see you've got this kind of final syllable that hangs. So the ending of all the non B rhyme lines is doubly de-emphasized because the final beat is removed and what is left um, as the line's final sound is an unstressed syllable. The overall effect of the rhythm, particularly in the short length of all the lines in fact, but also in the strong alternating iambic emphasis so that you have this kind of alternative beat all the way through the poem in all of the lines means that the overall kind of impression is bouncy and energetic. Um, and when I say short, they're short, shorter because generally in English literature and in sort of um, speech patterns, usually lines are longer. So usually iambic lines are in pentameter, which means that you have five metrical feet. So by taking off um, some of those metrical feet, some of those beats, it makes uh, the, it kind of creates an impression of uh, moving on quickly because you get on to the next line more quickly than the reader might expect. So that's why you, why often shorter lines create a more sort of bouncy, energetic feeling poem. So the rhythm creates an impression of the poem and the poem speaker, I think, as lively but also brusque because you have these lines that end with this hard masculine ending repeating through the poem. So to go through the poem line by line then, or rather quatrain by quatrain. So these are the first four lines, stanza one. Farewell, ungrateful traitor. Farewell, my perjured swain. Let, nev let never injured creature believe a man again. So the poem starts with an apostrophe to the speaker's lover. So ungrateful traitor, meaning kind of thankless betrayer, and perjured swain, meaning lying lover. But perjury is an interesting choice of diction. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines perjury as um, to prove false to a person to whom one has sworn an oath. So that is perjury. And to commit perjury is to lie in court. So there is a sense of official betrayal because he is her husband. So this isn't just lying. It's a kind of step beyond lying. It's official lying. You know, it's breaking your, your marriage vows, this oath you have made kind of before the laws of the land uh, and before, before God. Let never injured creature believe a man again. In other words, may no broken hearted woman ever trust a man again. And as I've already said, this is ironic in the audience at the play, the Spanish trial would know that this is ironic because he has not actually <laughs> betrayed her. Dryden's poem begins with an ending, the end apparently of the love affair. And this is repeated. So farewell, ungrateful traitor, farewell, my perjured swain. So this structure is an aphora. An aphora, as defined by the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms, is a rhetorical figure of repetition in which the same word or phrase is repeated in and usually at the beginning of successive lines, clauses or sentences. So the idea of farewell is emphasised because it's in the same position in the line and it's repeated. As with the repetition in the rhyme scheme throughout the poem, this opening 
anaphronic repetition suggests the idea of being trapped in a cycle and not being able to break free. And the irony is that Queen Leonora thinks she's trapped in the sort of traditional story or often repeated story of, you know, woman who's betrayed by ungrateful lover um, and the perpetual farewell of that kind of woman who has to keep saying farewell to this uh, ungrateful traitor lover. Um, but she's actually <laughs> trapped differently because she's trapped in thinking of herself in those terms as a betrayed lover when she's actually not. We might notice also that there is a slight difference in the structure of the two lines. So they seem to be kind of um, parallel, they seem to be identical. But this difference kind of ironically first suggests more distance and then suggests more closeness. Although the female speaker seems to be declarative in repeating farewell, she ironically moves from the generalised farewell ungrateful traitor to an image of holding her lover close or closer to her by including the possessive adjective my in the second line. Farewell my perjured swain. So it goes from the generalised farewell ungrateful traitor to the possessive, farewell my perjured swain. So there is almost an oxymor oxymoron in the image of farewell my lover, because he is not hers anymore in the kind of traditional farewell narrative. And the my sort of almost suggests that she cannot quite let him go even though she is apparently saying goodbye. We have also an internal echo, internal rhyme, in perjured and injured, to emphasise that his perjury has apparently directly led to her injury. So the, the echo there implies that the one has led to the other, the perjury has led to the injury. Having spoken in the specific, my swain, the speaker then broadens her lament to include all women and the generalised abstract a man. Let never injured creature believe a man again. And in the second quatrain, lines five to eight, the pleasure of possessing surpasses all expressing, but tis shoot too short a blessing and love too long a pain. Possess here means to have sex with. So in other words, the pleasure of sex is beyond words, but the joy blessing is over too quickly to compensate for the hurt caused by love. John Dryden's use of alliteration is particularly evident in this quatrain with the plosive P sounds of pleasure, possessing, surpasses, expressing, and the all important word pain. The P sound in this quatrain picks up the P of perjured. So that important word perjured, which I was talking about earlier. So the alliteration on P remains throughout the rest of the poem too. So in pity of your pain, line 10, the passion you pretended, line 17. And in the very final couplets, comparison of pleasure and pain. So the final, the line, the words at the end of the line in the last two lines also have this P alliteration of pleasure and pain. And this, of course, is a repetition of line five, uh, pleasure and possessing. So we've got this kind of link, pleasure, pain, possessing. The plosive P sound, so p, 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 just as a, as a sound kind of itself, is quite an active, energetic sound. And the repetition of the P sound so often throughout the poem makes the speaker sound um, angry, active, hostile and harsh because just by its nature that repetition of the P sound it has a kind of active energy to it. P, 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 you know, almost as though you are uh, spitting. 
And the closing couplet in this second quatrain is wonderfully balanced using um, parallel construction to enhance the antithetical imagery. So antithesis uh, from the classical Greek meaning opposite placing and the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms defines antithesis as a contrast or opposition, either rhetorical or philosoph uh, philosophical. In rhetoric, any disposition of words that serves to emphasise a contrast or opposition of ideas, usually by the balancing of connected clauses with parallel grammatical constructions as here. So you've got the parallel structure which enhances the antithetical meaning because by putting them in, in parallel you expose the differences between them. So and that's beautifully done here but sex it is too short a blessing and love too long a pain. So you've got the parallel structure of it, sex and love, and you've got too short and too long and then you've got a blessing and a pain. So by putting those directly in parallel, you are putting them more explicitly in contrast with each other and exposing, therefore, the kind of uh, antithetical, um, oppositional tone uh, within the poem. Moving on to stanza two, or the third quatrain, lines nine to twelve. Tis easy to deceive us in pity of your pain, but when we love you leave us to rail at you in vain. So in other words, it is easy to trick us into pitying you when you claim that you are in pain, in agony of love for us. So you use your pain to kind of lure us in to um, pitying you and then you're feeling emotional about you. But when we fall in love, you leave us to uh, castigate, to rage at, to thunder against futilely, to rail at you in vain. So earlier I mentioned the plosive kind of P angry alliteration of pity and pain, but this is contrasted here. So again, we've got we've got a lot of contrast, a lot of antithetical tones and sounds going on in this poem. So this is contrasted here with the more languid alliteration of the L sounds in love and leave. And the, the alliteration here helps to emphasise the antithesis between the two. So we women love, you men leave. And it's beautifully kind of condensed. We love, you leave. It's almost a kind of catchphrase because you've got this um, kind of balance, this antithetical balance. We love, you leave. Uh, furthermore, how this balance is kind of enhanced is because of the para rhyme here in love and leave. So a para rhyme is a half rhyme in which there is vowel variation, but the consonant uh, pattern remains the same. So essentially you have the same word, the same consonants in a word with um, a kind of assonance variation. So a variation of the vowels, but the consonants stay exactly the same, exactly as here. So love and leave. Those con in terms of the consonants, those two are exactly the same, but the vowels change love uh, is replaced by <laughs> different vowels in leave. So Dryden uses pararime, although the term pararime wasn't invented until much later in the 20th century, um, but Dryden uses pararime to enhance the idea prevalent, as I've said throughout the poem, of exposing difference through non-similarity. So by exposing this formal non-similarity, it suggests that the two things ought to be the same, but they are not. So I love and you should love too, but you don't love, you leave. It's managing to, to, to contrast the difference with what it ought to be 
So moving on to the second half of the second stanza or the fourth quatrain, lines 13 to 16. Before we have decried it, there is no bliss beside it, but she that once has tried it will never love again. You can see here particularly, I think it's a good example of the C rhyme building up to the then undercutting of the B rhyme because it has this extra kind of syllable and because it has the rhyme scheme repeating before we have decried it there is no bliss beside it but she that once has tried it yes will never love again so it's that kind of undercutting of the build the previous builder before we have discovered it so before we have experienced love for ourselves we imagine there is nothing more blissful than it but once a woman has actually experienced love she will never want to love again. The alliteration of the B sound before no bliss beside is undercut then by the curt but. <laughs> so before no bliss beside, but then, so we've got the, um, at the beginning of this quattro, we've got the B of before and then the B of but. And I will get, I will discuss buts uh, a bit more again later. Moving on to the third stanza, the fifth quatrain, lines 17 to 20. The passion you pretended was only to obtain. So again, we've got a different kind of um, repetition of the same sound. Here it's assonance, it's repetition of vowel sounds, only obtain. But when the charm is ended, the charmer you disdain. In other words, that the, the love that you feigned was only to obtain sex, but when the allure of having sex with a woman has ended, you disdain the woman. So we've got obviously the um, alliteration of charm and charmer, but it's more than just alliterative because you, you have the charm and the charmer, so the woman and the charm that she's supposed to kind of exude, are put in kind of opposition to each other again. As I've said, this is a very kind of antithetical poem where things are put in kind of contrast um, throughout. So there's an ironic use of the charmer here, which alludes to the kind of traditional image, I think, of the vixen woman who seduces a man against his will. The femme fatale type, another standard trope, because it is the man who has lied and deceived the woman, apparently, to bed her here. The implication, however, is that in such a situation, even though the pretending man is to blame, he still will throw the shade on the woman and dismiss her as the mere charmer. And the final quatrain, the last lines of the poem, lines 21 to 24. Your love by hours we measure, till we have lost our treasure, but dying is a pleasure when living is a pain. In other words, women suppose that men's love is as strong as women's love by, uh, your love by hours we measure. So much so that we lose our treasure, our hearts and virginity for its sake. But death would be more pleasurable than living with this pain. The poem's final couplet begins with a but. But this, as I said earlier, is not the poem's first but. The poem, as I've said, is made up of six quatrains and each follows the same structure in having the first couplet present an idea which is then kind of argued against and interrogated in the second couplet. The entire poem is a series of kind of antitheses. So this form is rigidly structured by having in the first quatrain let and thereafter five buts at the beginning of the third line of each quatrain. So the poem then is a series of objections and contraries, antitheses. 
an idea is put forward and then it is contradicted. But, so X, but Y. It's a series of ways in which woman thinks X, but actually it turns out that Y. And of course this is ironic for the poem as it sits within the play because that's exactly the situation that Queen Leonora is in. She thinks something is one way, but then there is a double discovery, then it turns out to be another way. So returning again to kind of the internal logic of the poem, a woman might think that something is wonderful, so the pleasure of possessing surpasses all expressing. The, the pleasure of sex is better than all words. But it is only afterwards that she is aware of a qualification or limitation of this view. But tis sex is too short a blessing to be worth the pain of love. So there is a pivot then on the monosyllabic but in the middle of five of the poem's quatrains, the final five. But as I said earlier, this is iambic in rhythm. So the second syllable in each metrical foot, each metrical foot that's present, not the catalectic ones, um, is highlighted. And so the but might not be immediately apparent to the reader because the but is not on the kind of emphasized syllable. So the repetition of this structure echoes and enhances the meaning of the content by showing how woman has been kind of, or at least in the mind of the, the character, the mind of the speaker shows how woman has been kind of constantly and repeatedly deluded and let down by men and by love, you know, since the beginning of time, since Olympia, since um, Dido, etc. And the kind of formality and regularity of it implies that it was a given that a woman should be aware that whatever she might now believe, whatever nice thing is now happening, be sure that a but will be coming to strip her of her pleasure and bring her pain. Just as the rhyme scheme seems to doom woman to repeat this same cycle indefinitely, so too does each quatrain's use of the pivoting but. But, as <laughs> I'm now very aware whenever I say but, but, um, as I've said, there is a fundamental irony to this poem because the but that is coming for the character Queen Leonora is a good but. Because she thinks it's one way she thinks she's been betrayed, but it turns out that she had not been betrayed. Another but <laughs> is should we actually accept that the message is as doom and gloom as all that, even within the internal logic of the poem. So the final epigrammatic couplet is beautifully structured using parallelism, and I've already spoken about this, the kind of parallelism of the, of the form enhancing the antithetical content, the meaning of the poem, the, the sh kind of exposing the differences by aligning things in parallel and then showing them to be antithetical. And this is kind of beautifully um, done in the final couplet, but dying is a pleasure when living is a pain. So rather like lines seven and eight, which I looked at earlier, the end of the, f the those are at the end of the first stanza where sex is too short a blessing and love is too long a pain. The antithesis is enhanced by the parallel construction here in the final couplet. Indeed, if we consider the parallel structures of the closing couplets of the first and the third stanzas, and I think that we are encouraged to do that because both end with the same B rhyme, pain. If we consider these, the closing couplets of the first and the third stanzas, we might see that the structure implies that there is in fact a naughty joke at the end of the poem. As I said earlier, bawdiness and wit were a common feature of restoration theatre. And the play in which Dryden's song sits, The Spanish Friar, has plenty of fruity content, shall we say. 
In the text just before the poem, for example, Queen Leonora talks of the night she has just spent with Torismond, her husband. She says, and asked him how I had offended him. He answered nothing, but with sighs and groans, so restless past the night, and at the dawn leapt from the bed and vanished. There is an echo again of Ariosto's Olympia's lament, which I quoted earlier here, in the image of the two as one in the marriage bed at night, but then not in the morning. So um, Olympia had said, last night in thee together, two found shelter. Alas, why two together are we not at rising? And so uh, Teresa then talks about sighs and groans being a sign of love and trembling sighs and groans and trembling being signs of love it's not exactly clear here what has elicited these sighs and groans i'll i'll leave that up to you to imagine what that might mean after the song Leonora begs Torismond to stay with her by recalling the sex they have had with each other. You shall not go by all the pleasures of our nuptial bed, she says. Given this context, returning to the poem, it would not be out of place for it to include some bawdiness. But sex is too short a blessing and love too long a pain. That construction is parallel. So the, the construction at the end of the first stanza is put in parallel with the construction of the lot, the couplet that closes the final third stanza. But sex is too short a blessing and love too long a pain, but dying is a pleasure when living is a pain. So those are kind of put in uh, parallel with each other in order to kind of compare them, it seems. Um, dying also uh, at the time was a, a euphemism for having an orgasm. So there might be a pun on dying here. Earlier in the poem, in line five, the pleasure of possessing had explicitly linked, as I said, through alliteration, um, pleasure with possessing, that is, sex. So there we had the pleasure of possessing, and now we've got the pleasure of dying. Through parallel form within the poem then is this idea that sex is aligned with dying, which is a blessing and a pleasure, and love is aligned with living, and we've got the alliteration of that L sound there, again we've got love and leave, love and living all sort of linked together through that alliterative L sound, which is nothing but a pain. So the naughty joke, perhaps, is that sex might be short-lived, but at least it is pleasurable and brings the blessing of relief, whereas love continues on living, bringing only pain. Sex, in other words, the speaker admits, remains a pleasurable distraction from the pain of love and of living. And note the present tense, dying is a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature, then do subscribe. And if you have liked the video, then do please press the thumbs up button. It helps me out in YouTube's algorithm. Thank you to everybody who has supported my channel. I really do appreciate it. And do you have any of your own observations about John Dryden's witty, um, ironic, marvellous poem, Farewell, ungrateful traitor. If you do, please leave them in the comments below.